Good day, Jamil. Dr. Jamil. I think dream together about your future, not my future, because I'm a, I'm an old surgeon now, and uh, I think we can dream about your future. Sir, I think that...
Greetings. Let me put the right background. Right there, that's more appropriate. Good morning, everybody. I didn't get exactly a rousing welcome. Uh, let's see here. So Dipka just getting here. Oh, Nargiza. Hello. Good oh, afternoon. Hey, listen. You wanna you wanna be the host? No, no, no. I today I don't know. Uh, all, you do, all, you do is, all you do is introduce. Greenlight. No, private chamber greenlight. But it has been a new science show. Be there. Come on, jump in. No, no, no. I I am not ready. <laughs> so next time. I'm trying to embarrass you. <laughs> this is going to be a good one. Uh, you have to stay for the whole thing, you know. That you may, because I think it's five presentations. Good morning, Sadipka. Yeah, good morning, John. How are you doing? I am fine. How are you? Good, good. Uh, you're not Sadipka, Dr. Arnold. Yeah. Is Sudipka or there's a couple of Sudipkas? Mukherjee. Are you Sudipka? You're not Sudipka. Dr. Arman. Okay. You're different. Okay. Fine. Oh, there, there's the yeah, others. Hello, John Bennett. Good evening from Bangladesh. Yeah, good, good evening, Dr. Ar Arman, right? Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> Hello, Sudipka. Yeah, I am fine. What okay, about you, John? Good, good. Let me, your camera's sure. okay? Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a, it's a moving program tonight. Huh? Yeah, everything is okay. Are you ready to start, uh, Sadepka? So, can, can, can we start? Yeah, sure. Sure, I'll introduce you and then you run the show, right? Sir, can you hear me, sir? Yes, Tarek, he, he hear you. Yeah, sure, I can I can uh, I can help you, but you have to tell me now. Do you have someone else on the panel that can help us? Uh, Dr. Armin? Uh, or, or, so how to share my can you have a co-host? Can you have co-host, please? Who will take over as Sudipka cannot uh, handle uh, it? Tarek, Tarek, are you okay? Sir, I'm uh, I'm not getting the sharing option in my yeah, okay. So can we start, John? Yeah, sure. Okay. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, Good morning. This is Dr. John Bennett broadcasting from beautiful Miami Beach. It's really like that here behind here with the beach. Uh, we have another uh, Bangladesh Pediatric Neurosurgery Grand Rounds. Uh, it's, it's run by Dr. Sudipka Kumar Mukherjee, who I met online. He, he asked me if he wanted to do a pediatric neurosurgery. I said, yes, we definitely need it. So welcome, Sudipka. It's your show. So thank you, John, for giving us a chance to uh, continue this program. I uh, Today, our program is Pediatric Brain Tumor, Part 1. 
in the in this uh, part dr shifat jamil tarek he will present his uh, part i request dr uh, tarek for presentation dr tarek please yes sir can you hear me sir yes uh yeah शेयरिंग ऑप्शन सर इन माई लैपटॉप Okay, I think someone has to lead them through, uh, or we can go to the next speaker and come back. So, Doctor Maidul Hasan, are you are you okay? Yes, sir. But I have no sharing option in my screen. John, what happened? The sharing option is absent in their screen. Uh. they should be able to handle it. i can't handle their screen sharing okay what what is the problem is there a problem they cannot screen share yes uh so there are no option in uh, like screen share so or anything what does like... it say what does it say can you screen show me what it says it says you cannot screen uh, mute unmute chat raise hand question answer Sign in. There's no These are all the options, but no share screen options, sir. Okay, let me go into my settings. Just give me a second. Doctor Sudipto, ah, please, please enter this to speaker as a panelist. Can anybody That's screen it. share? Yes. Could you could you That's try to discuss? लुकिंग आर्मन भाई की करते हैं पैनलिस्ट डॉक्टर तारक एवं डॉक्टर सियात के इट इज एनेबल्ड टू स्क्रीन शेयर इज एनेबल्ड दीप तो सुनते बात चल हाँ तो कुम तो कुन ऑप्शन देखी ना 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 आई बोल चीज़ वो वो रा संभव तो एटेंडी शबे वो रा डॉक्स है उधर के पैनलिस्ट शबे या तो भाई स्पीकर शबे ये करते रहो उट Someone that can screen share. You can screen share, Nakiza, right? Nakiza, you may. Yes, yes, I can. You can, can. you can start first. They will present later. I can screen share. Yeah, whoever can screen share, let's test them first. Okay, who is who? Do you want next, Pradipka? Okay, Doctor Arma, uh, DM Arman will present his uh, his piece. Then Doctor Shoykat and Doctor Tarik. Oh. Okay, please introduce Dr. Arman. Okay, Dr. Arman, could you see? Make sure you can screen share, please. Dr. Arman, could you screen share, please? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Can you screen share? And then you can introduce him to Dipka once he's 
Once we see, okay. Okay, Dr. Sudipka, can you uh, introduce Dr. Arman, please? Yeah. Uh, this is Dr. D.M. Arman. He is a pediatric neurosurgeon of National Institute of Neurosciences and Hospital. He will present uh, craniopharyngioma in pediatrics, different surgical approaches, part A, endoscopic endonasal approach. Dr. D.M. Arman, please. Can you see my screen? Yes, sure. perfect. Perfect. Can I start? Yes, sure. Please. Uh, this is session four, Pediatric Neurosurgery Webinar. Welcome to my presentation. I am Dr. D.M. Arman, going to present my uh, talk on endoscopic endonasal approach for pediatric craniofrangioma. This is our hospital, National Institute of Neurosciences, situated uh, at Dhaka, capital of Bangladesh. Here, we more than 40 neurosurgeons work here. Uh, in 2022, we performed near 3,000 operations. In the Department of Pediatric Neurosurgery, we did 538 neurosurgeries in the last year. In last few years, we did craniofringuma surgery 66. In the most of the cases, we did tumor resection through transcranial approach. You know, all craniofrangiomas are not suitable for endonasal endoscopic approach. As age of the patient, their nasal cavity, very narrow space in during procedure, instrument handling is very much difficult. And not all tumors are the midline or cystic or intracellular or supracellular. In only few selective cases, we did craniofrangioma for tumor resection through endoscopic endonasal approach. Introduction, craniofrangiomas are benign epithelial tumors that develop from residual cells of Rathke's pouch and tend to arise from the anterior superior margin of the pituitary. Craniofrangiomas are 0.8% of all brain tumors. They comprise 5 to 10% of pediatric brain tumors. Almost all craniofrangiomas have solid and cystic components. Calcification present in 50% of cases. There are two histological, they are, there are two histological types. Adamantinomatous and papillary. Type 1 bimodal age distribution, childhood peak age is 5 to 15 years, adult peak age 45 to 60 years. Type 2 occurs in adults with mean age of 40 to 55 years. Craniofrangioma are classified into intracellular, intra supracellular, supracellular, and intra third ventricular types based on location. Tumor location is key for choosing an optimal surgical approach for craniofrangioma resection. Craniofrangiomas are historically benign tumors, yet they may carry an unfavorable prognosis. Historically, aggressive surgical resection was the treatment goal to minimize risk to tumor recurrences via open transcranial approaches, but could have a clinical sequelae of visual, endocrine, and hypothalamic dysfunction. There are many approaches for successful craniofrangioma resection. The goal of surgery remains maximally safe resection, emphasizing preservation of visual, endocrine, hypothalamic function to maintain quality of life in this patient. The most common transcranial approaches are terional, frontolateral, orbitogyrotometric, subfrontal, transcalosal, and supraorbital approaches. Endoscopic cyst aspiration with Umayya reservoir placement in cystic craniofrangioma with hydrocephalus. The endoscopic endonasal approach should be considered as the first choice for intracellular, intrasupracellular, 
supracellular keratoconjunctiva to achieve better visual outcomes and fewer pituitary hormonal disorders endoscopic surgery provides better visualization of anatomic landmark and neurovascular structure with multi angled and close up views in the other hand in the pediatric population a concal sphenoid sinus and a smaller skull based narrow space in nasal cavity difficult instrument handling can make an endoscopic approach more challenging advantages of endoscopic anatomy approach are fewer faster recovery shorter hospital stay higher rate of gross total resection higher rate of improved visual outcome lower endocrine complication rates these advantages are higher risk of csf leak limited reach to purely thought ventricular tumors limited reach to tumors with significant lateral extension and steep learning curve now i share a case child with kenifrangima underwent tumor resection through endonasal endoscopic approach a 10 years old girl presented with headache and vomiting for 2 years her ct scan of brain showed hypodense lesion in the cellular and supracellular region calcium plaques are also seen no hydrocephalus is present mri of the brain showed hyperintense lesion in t1 and t2 and sagittal section showed seem to be third ventricular floor is pushed upwards this axial and sagittal and coronal views showed cystic lesion and also floor of the cellular region some solid portion is seen you see floor of the third ventricle is pushed upward and minimal lateral extension on the both side but no hydrocephalus developed we decided to do tumor resection through endoscopic endonasal approach to see the ismodular sinus we did ct scan of paranasal sinuses there is nematization of ismodular sinus is seen and no nasal septum deviation but a little hypertrophied inferior turbinate is seen her visual assessment showed normal visual function during operation in endoscopic endonasal approach patient positioning is very important the patient is positioned supine on the operation table with trunk raised 10 degree and the head is neutral position rotated 10 degree toward the surgeon the head is secured in a horseshoe headrest then disinfection and decongestion of the nasal cavities cotton patches soaked in povidone iodine are placed along the floor of the nasal cavities and in the space between nasal septum and middle turbinate allowed to take effect for 5 minutes disinfection of nasal skin is performed the cotton pad is soaked in a decongestant solution the formula of the decongestant solution is 1 mg adrenaline 5 ml lidocaine and 4 ml normal solution this is the dilution formula this decongestant solution are placed between nasal 
septum and the middle terminate allowed to take effect for 15 minutes. In the meantime, we uh, finish our hand wash and dropping is completed. Usually we prefer binostyl to surgeon technique. Zero degree endoscope is inserted into the right nostril. This is floor of the nasal cavity. This is nasal septum. This is inferior turbinate. Generally, uh, gently laterally fracture the inferior turbinate. The scope is moved along the floor of the nasal cavity following the inferior turbinate to reach the corner. This is corner. On the lateral surface, there is eustachian tube. The middle turbinate is gently lateralized to make a space between middle turbinate and nasal septum. Cotton patis is placed between the nasal septum and the middle turbinate. Middle turbinate is pushed laterally. The cotton patis is removed. This decongestion stroked cotton patis is essential to minimize bleeding during operation and also postoperative period. There will be a adequate space between nasal cavity and middle turbinate, superior turbinate, spinal ostium, and sphenoismodal vases are identified. This is sphenoidal ostium, this nasal septum, this is superior turbinate. This is experimental model recess. This is superior arch of the corner. In the experimental model recess, from superior arch of the corner, 1.5 centimeter above, there is experimental ostia. Coagulation of the experimental model recess. Spread ostium is enlarged with carison bone punches. Posterior nasal septectomy is done with leg slipper set, micro debrider, and backbiter. The bone of anterior smeared sinus wall is widely opened with microdale and bone punches. Mucosa of the smeared sinus is removed. Intra smeared septum is removed with diamond drill, five millimeter. The floor of the cella is opened with coarse diamond drill and cellar floor is enlarged with carison bone punches. Then anterior intercabinous sinus is coagulated with endoscopic bipolar electrodes. We usually use navigation during endoscopic endonasal approach. Here is a navigation probe. We also use carotid Doppler to locate the internal carotid artery on the both sides. Now, do I is open using sickle knife or retractable blade or endoscopic seizure? Here, this is endoscopic seizure. Now, solid portion of the tumor is seen at the cellar floor. Tumor is removed with curate, dissector, and suction, and tutor longer. After removing some part of the solid portion, there is a cystic portion of the tumor, cholesterol crystal appearance. After tumor removal, this structure, we could not recognize all structures seen here. After tumor removal, hemostasis achieved with surgical. Now, this dead space is packed with fat. We usually harvest fat and fasolata from the patient's right thigh, upper lateral aspect of the right thigh. 
then a piece of phospholata is placed in lay and fibrin glue is injected around the phospholata. And second piece of phospholata is placed on lay. Again, fibrin glue is injected around the phospholata. This nasal cellar flow reconstruction is very much important to prevent CSF leak. Then a piece of fat which harvested from thigh placed over the phospholata to support phospholata in position. Then suggestion is placed over fat. Finally, medializing the middle turbinate, marasil is inserted into both nostrils and kept a two to five days. Now I show video of this endoscopic anonogen approach for this girl. Endoscope is inserted through her right nostril. This is inferior turbinate. This is floor of the nasal cavity. This is nasal septum. Endoscope is moved along the inferior turbinate and to reach corner. This is superior arch of the corner. On the lateral surface, there is estrician tube open there. On the left nostril, we inspect left nostril. This is floor, this is nasal septum, this is inferior turbinate. On the left side, hypertrophied inferior turbinate is seen, needs to lateralize. Now, Inferior turbinate is lateralized. Then post middle turbinate laterally gently. To see the ostium of the sperm. See, this is ostium of the sperm. On the lateral side of the ostium, this is superior turbinate. This is superior turbinate. There an audio problem. This is sphenoid model recess. Now we lateralize superior turbinate to full expose of ostium sphenoid. This is clear view of ostium sphenoid. Now, decongestion solution soaked cotton petties is placed between middle turbinate and nasal septum to make more space 
and to decongested the operative field. Same procedure in the left nostril. If a species is inadequate, you may cut the middle turbinate lower two third. This is superior arch of the corner. This is sphenoid model recess. This is optium sphenoid. From superior arch of the corner, 1.5 centimeter above, ostium sphenoid is situated. Here, Sphenoplatin artery enters into the nasal cavity. You know, sphenoplatin artery is the branch of the maxillary artery, which is the branch of external carotid artery. We coagulate this sphenoplatin artery with monopolar electrodes to reduce bleeding during operation and also in the post operative period. You know, sphenoplatin artery gives septal and lateral branches to supply the nasal cavity. Nasal cavity also receives blood supply from anterior and posterior motor artery, which is branch of the ophthalmic artery of internal carotid artery also receives blood supply from superior labial artery of facial artery and also greater platinum artery of maxillary artery. Now, sphenoidal ostium is enlarged with Carison bone punches. On the left side, Sphenoid model recess also coagulated with monopolar electrode, then enlarged ostium sphenoidal with bone punches. Posterior septectomy is done with Blakesley forcep, backbiter, and micro debrider. Micro debrider is used to open posterior nasal septum. This is backbiter. Anterior sphenoid wall is removed through micro drill and bone punches and Blakesley forcep. Mucus of the sphenoid ostium is also removed. Posterior septum is 
more removed with backbiter. Then this is rostrum of the nasal septum. This is bomar. Bomar. We drilled. This is cutting bud drill. We removed rostrum of the nasal septum. This is inter spinal septum, and this is cellar floor, and this is clivus. As this is child of ten years old, so all anatomic landmarks are not seen. In transesphenoidal approach, lateral limit is median canal or pterygoid canal. When we found, when we find median canal, care must be taken. Internal carotid artery and V2 is nearby. You know, median canal contains median nerve. Median nerve composed of greater pectosal nerve and deep pectosal nerve. Greater pectosal nerve is the branch of parasympathetic fibers of facial nerve. And deep pectosal nerve is formed from sympathetic fibers around the ICA. This is mucus of the spinal septum, which is removed. Now, cellar floor is thinned out with diamond drill. This is inter spinal septum. Cellar floor is thin out. This is navigation probe to see the location of the instruments. Now thin bone is removed with freer elevator. Slur floor is enlarged with calcium pump. This is navigation probe to see where we are. And this is carotid Doppler to see the location of the ICA on the both sides. Now, 
Now, easily Dora is opened by sickle knife or retractable blade. Here we use endoscopic scissor to open Dura. Anterior intercapanous sinus is coagulated by endoscopic bipolar electrode. Then cut with sigil. Now you see that solid portion of the tumor. I try to expose tumor to a part dura on the both sides. And cystic portion of the tumor came out. Cystic portion is sucked out and tried to remove solid part. We try to enlarge. more cellar floor to see the superior portion of the tumor. And cut anterior intercapanous sinus. See, solid portion of the tumor, mostly calcium plaque. Gently dissect from surrounding structure. We remove solid part piecemeal by piecemeal. We use ring curet under surface of the dura. Try to remove residual part of the tumor. Here, we could not recognize all the structures thin here. It seemed to be some residuals could be resected as patient is neurologically normal no visual function deterioration, no endocrine function deterioration. We decided to stop here.
there is some residuals. After tumor removal, hemostasis was achieved with surgical. Then I reconstruct the cellar floor. This potential space is packed with fat, which was harvested from patient's right thigh. Then fascia flutter is placed over the fat inlay. This is first layer of fascia lata placed inlay. Then I inject fibrin glue around the fascia lata. Then second piece of fascia lata is placed overlay and then again inject fibrin glow around the fascia lata. Then fascia fat is placed over the fascia to support, and finally, middle is the middle turbinate, and marrow cell is inserted on the both nostril. After operation, patient recovered well and in operative day evening, we did post-op CT scan of brain. CT scan showed very good decompression, seemed to be Gross total resection. This is pre-op picture and this is post-op picture. And in the early post-operative period, she developed diabetes incipitus and we managed well. And on the day of discharge, after two weeks of surgery, she was okay. 
in conclusion the management of paradigm for canopyngioma has shifted from aggressive dissection to maximally safe dissection emphasizing quality of life issues particularly in regards to visual endocrine and hypothalamic function the introduction and refinement of the endoscopic endonasal approach has revolutionized surgery for canopyngiomas the management of canopyngiomas requires a multidisciplinary approach involving neurosurgery endocrinology otolaryngology ophthalmology and oncology this is end of my talk i am stopping here thank you very much everyone thank you dr d m arman for your academic and important surgical video actually craniopharyngioma is a very complicated tumor it involves endocrine visual apparatus and hypothalamus also and its recurrence rate is very high so there is no strict consensus that how much craniopharyngioma we remove but patient safety is fast and endoscopic procedure may be the final solution for surgical approach for almost all craniopharyngioma thank you for presenting a nice education anal video now i request dr pare shipadjan tare for presenting his speech dr shipadjan tare please thank you sir can you hear me sir yeah uh, yes pare respe respected teachers faculties and dear audiences uh sir can you see the screen of my yeah, computer perfect. perfect yes thank you sir uh today <clears throat> uh i am going to discuss or uh, present about the clinical presentation of pediatric uh, brain tumor i am dr sifat jamil tarik phase b resident uh, national institute of neuroscience Uh, the common pediatric brain tumors are astrocytoma, uh, which may be in cerebellum, brainstem, optic nerve, or any other uh, uh, location. Craniopharyngioma, primary neuroectodermal, primitive neuroectodermal tumors, mainly medulloblastoma, ependymoma, and pineal region tumors. Here's a picture showing the <clears throat> difference between adult and pediatric. Uh, brain tumor location in the picture you can see that uh, in case of adult 80 to 85% cases are in the supratentorial region and only 15 to 20% in intratentorial region but in pediatric patient this is totally reversed and 60% tumors in the infratentorial and 40% in supratentorial region in children uh, <clears throat> more tumors lie below the tentorium that means infratentorial region which includes cerebellar astrocytoma medulloblastoma brainstem glioma ependymoma but in adults the commonest tumors are glioma metastasis meningioma etc and most lie in the supratentorial region in case of supratentorial tumor uh from clinical features from aspect of clinical features first comes the progressive focal neurological deficit uh, these are caused by destruction of brain parenchyma by tumor invasion or infiltration due to compression of brain parenchyma by mass effect or peritumoral edema or hemorrhage if lesion in the frontal lobe then the focal features may be contralateral face arm leg, leg weakness or hemiparesis or hemiplegia ex expressive or motor dysphagia if dominant hemisphere involved personal change antisocial behavior loss of inhibition loss of initiative and intellectual impairment etc 
if tumor involve the parietal lobe, then there may be cortical sensory impairment, stereognosis, sensory inattention, lower homonymous synovia, et cetera. If tumor in temporal lobe, then receptive dyspecia, if dominant hemisphere involved, auditory hallucination, memory impairment, upper homonymous quadrantopenia. If tumor in occipital lobe, then visual field defect, like homonymous anopia may occur. Supratentorial tumors may directly damage optic nerve or olfactory nerve, presenting as impairment of vision or olfaction or smell. If cavernous sinus compression or invasion may involve uh, cranial nerves, oculomotor, trochlear, trigeminal, uh, cranial nerves. If hypothalamic and craniopharyngeum or pituitary tumor may present with endocrine dysfunction, diabetes insipidus, or Cushing syndrome, or any other endocrine presentation may occur. There are some non focal symptoms of signs in case of supratentorial brain tumor or pediatric brain tumor. Sign symptoms of raised ICT like headache, papilledema, vomiting, epilepsy. This, is, this can differentiate from supratentorial and infratentorial brain tumor due to it occurs due to cortical irritation by tumor, often focal in onset and may generalize secondarily. There are some special features or uh, uh, aspects about headache in brain tumor. Headache in brain tumor may occur with or without raised ICP, may be associated with raised ICP or without raised ICP. Classically described as being worse in the morning, possibly due to possibly due to hypoventilation during sleep. This may actually may not be present. Often exacerbated by coughing, straining, bending forward, placing head in actually uh, um, that means placing head in dependent position, whether it may be coughing, straining, or bending. Associated with nausea, vomiting in 40% cases in some study may be temporarily relieved by vomiting. And this is also possibly due to hyperventilation during vomiting. These above features, along with the presence of a focal neurological deficit or seizure, may help to differentiate tumor headache from other primary headache like tension type headache or uh, migraine headache. However, headache in 77% of brain tumor patient is similar to tension type headache. And in 9% is migraine like, only 8% showed the classic brain tumor headache, that means morning uh, headache, uh, other features. Two thirds of this patient had raised ICP features. Now comes the commonest tumor in pediatric patients, the infratentorial tumor. In case of infratentorial tumor, seizures are rare. Since seizures arise from irritation of cerebral cortex, most posterior fossa tumors present with signs and symptoms of increased ICP due to hydrocephalus like headache, nausea, vomiting, due to increased ICP from hydrocephalus or from direct pressure on the vagal nucleus or the area postima, so called vomiting center. And papilledema estimated incidence is 50 to 90 percent. Chronic increased pressure to the uh, 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 optic disc can cause irreversible blindness from optic nerve atrophy, which is called secondary optic atrophy. And uh, other feature may be gait disturbance, ataxia, vertigo, etc. Now, some focal features or focal sign symptoms uh, in pediatric group due to uh, infratentorial brain tumors. If it involves cerebellum, that the feature may be nystagmus, scanning speech. Gate disturbance or ataxic gate or truncal, maybe truncal or appendicular. If barm is simple, then truncal ataxia. Dysmetry or pass pointing, dysdiadogokinesis, uh, and other cerebellar signs may be present. If the brainstem involvement, then it may cause cranial nerve pulses, long track sign, maybe motor hemiplegia, hemiparesis, sensory long track sign, deterioration of consciousness level due to compression to the reticular formation. Tremor if red nucleus involved, 
impaired eye movement or pupillary abnormalities. This is from the cranial nerve pulses and vomiting hiccup if medulla is involved by brain tumor. And this is an, in a nutshell about the clinical features. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Tarek, for presenting clinical feature in relation to pediatric brain tumor very simply. This is an important thing that presents a complex thing in a simple way. But complex thing, complex way is not good. But so far, I recognize the presentation of Tarek is a complex thing he presented a simple way. I think we must uh, get some teaching from Tarek on this uh, topics again and again. Thank, thank you, you Tarek. Thank, thank you, sir. Now I request Dr. Maidul Hassan Shaikar for another complex presentation is the classification of pediatric brain tumor. This is this may be the most complex portion of today's presentation. I request Dr. Maidul, please present your case. Uh, please. Thank you, sir, for giving me the opportunity to be a panelist of today's session. Okay, we want to start the screen share, please. Um, it looks like you're not starting. You're not starting the screen share. Okay, there you go. Okay, make it presentation mode. Could someone help him uh, get the presentation mode, please? I do, Lindy. Can you hear uh, me, sir? Yeah, it's at the bottom, right? Could you explain, ex please explain where the screen share the <laughs> At the very bottom, to the right, there's five options. There, there, you, go. there you go. Okay, okay. In that area. Okay, perfect. Okay, sir. Uh, I am Dr. Maidul Hassan Shaykot, a resident from National Institute of Neurosciences and Hospital, Dhaka, Bangladesh. Now I am discussing about classification of pediatric brain tumors. Among all childhood cancers, brain tumors are the second only to leukemia in incidence, approximately 20%. The most common solid pediatric tumor, comprising 40 to 50% of all tumors. Annual incidence is two to five cases per one lakh. The most pediatric brain tumors are infratentorial, like brainstem glioma, cerebellar astrocytoma, medulloblastoma, etc. Other commonly encountered brain tumors in this age group are craniopharyngioma, pineal region tumors, teratoma, optic nerve glioma, etc. Now moving on to classification. The classification has been depicted from the recent edition of WHO classification and some other references. The first uh, type is gliomas, glioneuronal tumors, and neuronal tumors. Pediatric type diffuse low grade glioma are diffuse astrocytoma, angiocentric glioma, polymorphous low grade neuroepithelial tumor of the young. Pediatric type diffuse high grade glioma are diffuse midline glioma, diffuse hemispheric glioma, and infant type hemispheric glioma. Among the circumscribed astrocytic gliomas, there are pilocytic astrocytoma, non pilocytic astrocytoma pleomorphic xanthoastrocytoma, and subependymal giant cell astrocytoma. This figure shows right cerebellar pilocytic astrocytoma on the right picture and pleomorphic xanthoastrocytoma in the left picture. 
Now some glioneuronal and neuronal tumors such as ganglioglioma, desmoplastic infantile ganglioglioma, dysembryoplastic neuroepithelial tumor or DNET, gangliocytoma, dysplastic cerebellar gangliocytoma, which is also known as Larmit Duclos disease. Group of ependymal tumors consist of subsupratentorial ependymoma, posterior fossa ependymoma, and subependymoma. There are some histological types such as clear cell ependymoma, mostly found in supratentorial region, and danicytic ependymoma along any of the ventricles of the brain. This picture shows posterior fossa and supratentorial ependymoma. Now, chorate plexus tumors. The examples are chorate plexus papilloma, atypical chorate plexus papilloma, and chorate plexus carcinoma. This is a figure of chorate plexus papilloma. You can see the lesion on the right cerebral hemisphere. Now, embryonal tumors are medulloblastoma and atypical teratoid or rhabdoid tumor, which is also known as ATRT. The histological varieties of medulloblastoma are classic, desmoplastic or nodular, with extensive nodularity, large cell or anaplastic medulloblastoma. Here you can see different sections of MRI of brain showing medulloblastoma in the midline. Another picture showing you a atypical rhabdoid teratoid tumor occupying the left frontal region. Now, pineal tumors are pineocytoma, pineal parenchymal tumor of intermediate differentiation, pineoblastoma. Among the mesenchymal non meningothelial tumors, there are hemangioma, rhabdomyosarcoma, primary intracranial sarcoma, Ewing sarcoma, lipoma, chondrosarcoma, and osteoblastoma are common, commonly found. Hematolymphoid tumors such as lymphoma, Langerhans cell histiocytosis, and Rosai Dorfman disease. Among the germ cell tumors, germinoma, embryonal carcinoma, endodermal sinus tumor, choriocarcinoma, and teratoma are commonly found in pediatric age groups. This is a germinoma occupying the pineal region that causes obstructive hydrocephalus by compressing the cerebral aqueduct. Tumors of the cellar region are adamantinomatous craniopharyngioma. Among pituitary adenoma, prolectinoma corticotropinoma may be found, but thyrotropinoma and others are very rarely found. The right image is the CT scan of brain in axial section showing calcification in the cellar region, which is craniopharyngioma. Apart from my previous discussion, there are some other classification according to location, such as brainstem glioma, like tectal or mesencephalic, focal brainstem tumor, which are typically pilocytic astrocytoma, dorsal as exophytic tumor, cervicomedullary tumors. All of these are low-grade gliomas. And the last one, that is diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma, or DIPG, is high-grade one. Among cerebellar astrocytoma, there are varieties like pilomyxoid astrocytoma, diffuse fibrillary astrocytoma, diffuse anaplastic astrocytoma, and glioblastoma multiform. And uh, the other, among other tumors, there is optic pathway glioma. Optic pathway glioma may arise from any site of the optic pathway, like optic nerve, optic chiasma, optic tract, optic radiation. This picture shows you uh, the right one, that there is a left optic nerve glioma. And the left picture shows you a optic chiasmal glioma that compresses third ventricle causing obstructive hydrocephalus. There are some genetic syndromes involving brain tumors, such as neurofibromatosis, tuberous sclerosis complex, von hippel lindau disease, Gorlin syndrome, leaf romani syndrome, and rhabdoid predisposition syndrome. This is a picture of a baby suffering from neurofibromatosis type 1 who has a characteristic 
cutaneous manifestations like caffeolate spots and multiple subcutaneous nodules. So here ends my presentation. Thank you for your patience here. Thanks, Rujipka. Thanks, Dr. Shoikov, for your nice presentation. This is a very complicated topic that presenting pediatric brain tumor. Please, Dr. Shoikov, unshare your screen. Thank you, sir. So, the next presentation from my side, that is medulloblastoma. Medulloblastoma, you know, that is a topic uh, when we saw a patient comes with features, clinical features of posterior foca midline tumor. Uh, at first, we are the neurosurgeon, we feel betrayed because uh, this is a very bad tumor. And when we explore the information to uh, guardian, guardian also feel hopeless because outcome of this tumor is very bad. So is it always bad? My, our director sir, of neuroscience hospital, he asked us a question about 11 years back. One patient that patient is a daughter of his friend. He, she was operated for medulloblastoma at least 11 or 12 years back. Patient is doing very well. But our teacher, he asked us why patient is very well. And because we always tell med, outcome of medulloblastoma is bad. At that time, we don't have the proper answer. So if we uh, search the answer, we get some part of the medulloblastoma is not hopeful or hopeless. That is hopeful also. So how we find out the hopeful group of medulloblastoma? We know that, that is a great four tumor. So among the great four, there are some tumors that is hopeful. That is the light within a dark uh, status. So now I present, I, my presentation is divided into two parts. That is, today is the initial part. In the second part, I want to present the surgical techniques or surgical strategy in medical restaurant. So everybody here and share uh, my screen. Is it okay? Yes, sir. John, my yes. screen sharing is okay? Uh, okay, okay. Okay, sir. Okay. Uh -huh. So, see, when we say a case of medulloblastoma, we do the seven thing. That is primary evaluation of patient. Next, we can do surgery of an evaluation, post-operative evaluation, histopathological and molecular workup, oncological management, advanced workup, and follow-up. This seven step work is very important for any brain demand. But for medulloblastoma, this is more important. Medulloblastoma is not uncommon tumor. This is at average 25 to 30 percent tumor of all posterior foca tumor, common in five to seven years with group. And incidence is gradually rising. Why? Maybe more diagnosis nowadays, but there may be some other factors. At first, we are talking on pre-operative evaluation. It consists of two parts. One is clinical 
evaluation. Next is diagnostic workup. Clinical presentation, it is like other posterior to the midline tumor. Dr. Tarek already said that when the tumor arises or infiltrates the area postrema or chemoreceptor trigger zone, it may present with vomiting. But if usually medulloblastoma comes from the roof of the post ventricle, so in that case, it occludes CSA pathway, it causes pressure effect, does it present with headache, increased features of ICP like vomiting, visual dimness due to fatigue edema, and sometimes it develops with diplopia, when it infiltrates the vermis, it may present with central ataxia. Very rarely it presents with seizure, but there is no definite clinical feature of medulloblastoma or posterior feature of prostatium. It intermingles with other clinical features. For diagnostic work, for diagnosis, initially we always do CT scan. CT scan is the gold standard for all intracranial patients. But important thing you see in the non enhanced CT scan or in plain CT, medulloblastoma is isodense. So if there is a small lesion, and if you not focus it very meticulously, uh, if you have no contrast city, so you can miss it. So for resident, this is a message. If a patient you suspect there is an intracranial space occupying lesion, always you do contrast. Without contrast, you can miss some a small isodense lesion. And in CT, you see there are some hydrocephalopods. And this patient, this CT, there is homogeneous enhancement, and there is no definite classification in medulloblastoma. But in appendymoma, there are some classification. But when we do MRI, there are some important issues when we do MRI. MRI show same lesion, but MRI is an important thing. In, you must check entire craniospinal area to check the so-called sugar coating lesion, and it indicates CSF mates, and it is a very bad. Uh, prognostic uh, parameter for a patient. And another thing that the diffusion weighted image, the diffusion restricted posterior preparation is a bad patient. That is, diffusion restricted lesion is a bad lesion. After doing the clinical work and radiological work, we may staging the medulloblastoma. There are two states. One is tumor states, that is size of tumor or tumor infiltration to grounding parenchyma and presence or absence of meats or systemic dissemination. But in our practical work, we are not frequently used this staging uh, regularly. One thing is very important, the CSF tapping by lumbar tap before surgery is contraindicated. As because due to high ICP, there is a chance of cloning. So here resident, please, Avoid any CSF tapping before surgery by lumbar tap. Now come to 
surgical strategy. There is a lot of controversy regarding CSF diversion before surgery. There are different methods, like we can do ETV, we can do repetition, we cannot do anything. So there are different ways. But one important parametric uh, calculation done by one Canadian group, that is the predictive protocol. They make some scoring, that is AIDS, presence of papilledema, presence of preoperative hydrocephalus, cerebral mates, and preoperative estimation of radiological estimation of tumor. So by that prediction, you can assess that what you can do. You can do preoperative CSF diversion or not. But the thing is very important that you must customize your treatment plan as per uh, your center. Without customization, the treatment is quite impossible. If we follow other center rule, we may lose the patient. Why? If we don't do any CSS diversion prior to surgery, and if after surgery we need some CSS diversion urgently, you think very urgent CSS uh, or ultra acute urgency CSS diversion, is it possible in our setup? It is not possible. You may at least take, take two or three hours. So this two to three hours in a post-operative bed patient is very important. But what we can do, what we are doing regularly in our center, we do VP shunt regularly. Some case we do ETB, both are good. But what we can do, we may practice Fredier Barhol and Fredier Barhol EVD temporarily we put and then uh, manage the EVD as per rule. In my next session, I can details go through the Fredier Barhol and EVD as a surgical strategy. Next is the uh, removal of tumor. The prone position, posterior midline incision, craniotomy, Y-shaped dural opening, the removal of tumor, gross total removal with patient safety, that is the rule. But there are so many variations as per tumor location, as per your setting. So we can detail this thing in our next session. The surgical in the lesson of surgical strategy. Gross total resection is our target, definitely. But if some tumor is tightly adherent with brain skin, you can leave some tumor and that may count as a gross total resection by oncologist. Now, post-operative evaluation. It should be clinical tissue analysis, imaging, and CSF study. There are four important issues in post-operative evaluation. Now, come to clinical. There is a lot of complication, which is some are predictable, some are unpredictable. After uh, uh, medulloblastoma surgery. Like predictable complication is nystigma, ataxia, nausea, vomiting, CSF leakage, wound infection, pseudomeningocil, cerebellar mutism. But some unpredictable complication is there. Like prolonged respiratory suppression, unconsciousness, cranial nerve deficit. Cranial nerve actually not in the field of medulloblastoma, but sometimes. Medulloblastoma extended laterally from an oplusca, so cranial nerve deficit may occur. So that is an unpredictable complication. Medulloblastoma usually not infiltrate 
mid brain but unconsciousness may happen after surgery so that is the unpredictable complication Sometimes we don't touch the floor of the fourth ventricle, but we saw there is a prolonged respiratory depression. That is an unpredictable complication. So these three are unpredictable. The rest of them are predictable, but we must manage the, all the complications. If you do surgery, complication is there. But as a surgeon, you must manage the complication. So now, Tissue analysis. Tissue analysis classically done by hematoxylin and eosin stain by, for, uh, by histopathology. By this procedure, we can find out the medulloblastoma. And by this stain, we can differentiate medulloblastoma into four groups that is, classic desmoplastic, medulloblastoma with extensive nodularity and last anaplastic cell. But this classification is not very much useful for prognostication as well as post-operative oncological management. Two things. One is prognostication. By tissue analysis, you may, you may tell the patient guardian that what is the prognosis of this patient. But this histopathological finding is not helpful on that regard. And there are some new oncological uh, treatment for medulloblastoma that is called target therapy. That may not perform by this histopathology. So we do something new, something recent, something advanced. And Truly speaking, I do some work with our Professor Nofil sir in last couple of months. And in this session, I inform you that we can do all necessary investigation for molecular subtyping. Maybe some in our country, maybe some in overseas country. And the total cost of the package is below 20,000 so far I know. So it is not a big amount of money, but after doing this investigation, you will uh, give a big step for further work, like prognostication as well as future advanced management. By molecular study, we differentiate one medulloblastoma into four subgroups. First one is wind subgroup for the resident. This wind subgroup is the tumor which are, have benign character but malignant cell. Its survival rate is very good. Overall, survival is more than 90%. So, can you ima imagine that a High grade tumor, a bad tumor, where we deserve survival, long term survival is more than 90%. Actually, it is 95% nowadays in wind group. Second group, SHLs, but or sonic love group. I think you feel uh, this is critical, but I think it is not critical. It is very easy if you understand. Sonic is a group. The survival rate is excellent, but radio chemo is indicated. In wind groups, theoretically no need of radio chemo, but some oncologists suggest low dose radiation over or in more than three years this group. Now in the third and fourth group. Third and fourth group, group three, group four. Previously, we have an idea that group three, group four, all are very bad. We think if we see a patient of group three, group four, I think we think this is a dead patient. But very recently, we get an idea that group three, group four are not same. Group three is bad, but group four, their survival rate is good. 
So division of this four group, for this division, we need some molecular work. Some molecular work that are already available in our country and in our hospital. But some molecular work up is still now not available in our center. I think it will be available very soon. But it is available in some overseas country and the cost is not very high. Whole package is below 20,000. So this is a guideline which was published by Indian Society of Neuro Oncology. This is very simple. You say, see, we do three markers. In the left hand side, beta catenin, GAB1, TF1, three marker only, not, not too much, three marker. And we have grossly three groups, wind, SHAs, and group three, group four. That means non wind non SHA. So where beta catenin is positive, SHAs and uh, the beta catenin is strong, EF is strong, but GAB uh, negative, that may be a wind. But where GAB and EF is strong, beta catenin negative, that may be SHA. And all three negative. That is non wind, that is group three, group four. So, this is not a rocket technology, I think. This is, this is a simple cabin. If we do three markers, so you can um, uh, take a decision from this three markers. But if you go through different journal, different textbooks, somebody tell four markers, somebody tell eight markers, somebody tell 14 markers. That is expensive, but this is a simple guideline, I think. Now, come to the next point that I already discussed this thing. So, if you go further advance, that is four marker, some group of patients, where the is less than three, ER negative, MOIC amplification high, PP53 mutation present, and 17Q chromosome gain, that is very poor prognosis. Now come to another point. I already say something about immunohistochemistry. Some patient where we need to see the DNA amplification, which test by DNA methylation. Already in our hospital, our authority installed a fish machine. And so far we gave that when reagent will available, this test will be available in our center. See, this is a chart made by myself. So this chart is not very uh, critical. At first, in the top, you will get a medulloblastoma to three marker, beta catenin, GAB, EF. If beta catenin positive, GAB negative, EF positive, it is a queen group. So there is a chance of survival more than 95% low risk. And 10% beta catenin negative, GABIA positive, that is SHAs. SHAs is 35% is among all medulloblastoma. When you get a SHA, we need another test that is important. Twist test, that is TP53 mutation present or not. TP53 mutation doing is not a regular case. When you get a win, you have no need to TP53. TP53 mutation checking is not of very much expensive, maybe 5,000 kappa. So in those groups, 
where T P fifty three Y that means not mutated, their survival rate is very good, seventy to eighty five percent. But where mutation is present, see the survival rate is very poor, only forty percent. So when you think this is a case of S H H two, you must do T P fifty three in that case. Next, if all three negative, beta catenin, gabia negative, this is a non wind, non SSH group. Now we must get MOIC amplification. That means the whole exome sequencing, DNA mutation test, that is very expensive also. But what is the usefulness of this test? You see, this test is not necessary for SAH. This test is not necessary for wind. This test is only necessary for non wind, non SAH group. That means all three negative. So, by this test, we can differentiate group three and group four. Group four, their survivability is not bad. That is average 75 to 95%, 90%. But group three, their survival rate, if there is mates, less than 50%. If no mates, more than 50%. But both are bad. So a medulloblastoma patient should be tested according to these guidelines. Initially, these three tests, that means three immunohistochemistry for all. After these three immunohistochemistry, if you think this is a win, no need of any more test. This is SIJ, only TP53 test. But this is a non wind SIJ. So you can do MOIC amplification, then check risk factor, then check <coughs> chromosomal loss present or not. So one day, this group, you need some expensive test. But for other, all other groups, you can do a package below 20,000. I think it is not very much expensive. Now come to post-operative neuroimaging. Dear resident, there are some protocols of post-operative neuroimaging. In some center, they do contrast MRI of brain immediate within 24 to 48 hours. In our center, why we not do it regularly? Because usually we do uh, post-op imaging at evening. You know, at that time, MRI may not available. And in our setup, a MRI under sedation of a posterior protocol is very much risky. Actually. So what is our protocol? We do a CT scan one. But if it is contrast, you can do, I think contrast is very, not very much mandatory for post-op checking. What do we want to see in the evening city? Evening city, we want to see is there any hemorrhage? Is there any acute hydrocephalus? Or is there anything what needed to immediate redo surgery? So, airplane city is an appointment. That is the evening city. After two to three weeks, you must do a complete workup, but not later than four weeks. After four weeks, there may be recurrence. So, why two to three weeks? There may be some uh, hemostatic event or blood debris that may cause an artifact. So, the best time is two to three weeks. Complete workup. Complete workup means do a plain and contrast MRI of brain with diffusion weighted image with this whole spine screening. But in our setting, is it regularly we do? Why? Because there is a long queue for MRI. But the ideal time is two to three weeks, you know. And at that time, CSF cytology is mandatory. In some center, they do CSF collection during post-operative, uh, during surgery. After just opening the dura, 
we collect we uh, suck CSF from tumor cerebellar uh, medullary system. They collect two or three CC CSF from there and do cytotherapy. I think that is a very good practice. We can start here. After during doing the surgery, we can collect CSF and we can do cytology. If there is a tumor cell with a CSF, so that patient have CSF mates either radiologically detected or non-detected. But this one, the two after two to three weeks, this is mandatory. But please check the CSF in few specific centers. In our country, so far we know in government level or uh, autonomous level, only BSNU have this setup of cytospin method. They have pediatric hematology department. They have that <coughs> a cytospin method to check the uh, any malignant cell within CSF. That is a special method. If you check in other place, they never get a malignant cell. But in uh, uh, right now, some private center also do this. Uh, but in uh, autonomous setup, BSME are uh, doing this nice. And some clinical assessment is important. That is neurocognitive status, endocrine status, caring status. Endocrine status is not important like a craniofaringioma, but they saw in some medulloblastoma, they have some endocrine malfunction after surgery. So endocrinologist must give a follow-up after surgery to check it. And some patients have some hearing problem. So these three should be assessed. Now oncological management. We are just in escaping. We are in the fourth question, oncological management. Traditionally, we have two types of oncological management. One is radiotherapy, one is chemotherapy. So all, uh, this is for a long time. Radiation therapy started for medulloblastoma for a long ago. Radiation oncologists nowadays think the fraction radiation, that means a small amount of uh, radiation in a repeated dose is better than <coughs> massive radiation. They say hyperfraction is the better. And they also advocate low risk wind tumor can be treated with low dose strenuous spinal radiation. Now, there are some important issues. Which one is residual tumor? Which one is recurrent, or which one is radiation-induced encephalomalacia. Chemotherapy. During radiation, there are only few chemotherapeutic agents they use, but only uh, interesting. But after completion of radiation, they start the main chemotherapy, that is Lomustin, vincristin, uh, vincristin, and cisplatin. That is called the LVC protocol. This is a slide which I borrowed from my friend, Dr. Sabina Korim. She actually divides uh, the medulloblastoma patient, which they get in their cancer hospital, OPD. So how many patients went through chemo? How many patients get radiation? They saw a lot of patients drop out after coming in OPD. That is a bad thing. After surgery, we send all patients to uh, cancer institute, but they went but after then, then there is a big dropout. So that uh, we must encourage the patient. Please take post-operative chemo radiation as per necessary, advised by oncology. Now complication of therapy. You know the 
Hemoradiation is not a inert thing, especially for young kids below three years. They have a more they have more chance of complication, cognitive from uh, dysfunction, musculoskeletal dysfunction, endocrine dysfunction. So these three things comes again. I think this is a big debate and this is a big talk that is recurrence radiation induced in cephalomeratia versus residual. We can discuss it in a later session where we emphasis on radiology and definition of the three. Now there are some advanced management. It shows a new horizon. And up to this, I discuss about the current landscape of medulloblastoma management. In new horizon, there are four important factors. That is clinical factor, biological factor, epigenetic study, and brain tumor microenvironment. We are resident. You think it is very much critical, but I tell you very simply. I already tell you the prognostic factor that is age, extent of dissemination, and extent of surgical detection. These are three important prognostic factors. And the fourth important prognostic factor is the molecular subtyping. One term, it is new for you, that is epigenetic factor. For your understanding, you know the folic acid is an important factor for developing neural tube defect. All of you know, I think. So here, folic acid prevents some genetic changes. That genetic changes causes neural tube defect. So folic acid is an epigenetic factor. So what is epigenetic? Epigenetic is such thing which influence the genetics. So why epigenetic is a new horizon? So if we know epigenetic for this tumor, this disease, so we can prevent that disease. We can modify the treatment protocol. So now you can assess that epigenetic is how much important. In our hospital, we are doing some research to detecting newer epigenetic factor for neural tube defect. Already we get some. So in medulloblastoma, researchers get a lot of epigenetic factor. And they also get some uh, oncological management on the basis of epigenetic factor. Now, for med medulloblastoma, you see, I am not going through details that make you uh, a cumbersome situation. There are some epigenetic factors like DNA methyl transfer inhibitor, some chemotherapeutic agent comes in the field on, the ba on that background, that is bromodomain or something else. Lithium is the antipsychotic agent, now comes as a epigenetic factor because it is related with TP53 mutation. Valporic acid is an anticonvulsant. Now it comes in the field of as an oncological management for TP53 mutation. So detection of newer and newer epigenetic factor for any tumor or any disease that open a new horizon for management of this disease for prevention and treatment of This is a uh, big uh, graphical uh, thing that where the epigenetic factor work and where the drug work. Some drug like visuchmol disease or uh, funny disease, it crosses the phase two trial also. In this type of drug comes on the background of epigenetic factor. And this type of treatment is called targeted therapy. 
this newer targeted therapy has less side effect and more specific effect on tumor uh, removal. So this is a new concept for any tumor management that is called tumor microenvironment. This tumor develop a microenvironment in their tissue. That means they reorganize the cell, they reorganize the supporting cell and other tissue as their disease process. So if we work on this microenvironment, so it may uh, reduce the disease better. Uh, it may reduce the progression and reduce the relapse. So how we can work through microenvironment? That is by nanoparticle focused ultrasound. That means if you give ultrasound wave and chemotherapy at the same time, so ultrasound wave help to passes the drug through blood brain barrier. The main thing is the quality of life of the treatment. So we, if we give a combined therapy through different people at the same time, so we can get a better quality of life. So what is the take home message? The tissue diagnosis, molecular subtyping is very important. <clears throat> Preoperative, perioperative ventriculostomy is helpful, better than traditional preoperative CSF diversion. Either the diagnosis is an important prognostic factor. A second surgery should be considered if it is a residual tumor, but if it is a recurrence after complete radiation and chemotherapy, second surgery will not help. If tumor involves the critical structure, some tumor should be keep uh, or left out. So now come for follow-up and washing for recurrence and <clears throat> other complications. So there are some research group, they work worldwide, that is, uh, they work comprehensively for medulloblastoma and for other childhood uh, tumor. This is a simple data what we get from our department that is in 2018 we did 31 medulloblastoma in 1945. In the corona time we did a small amount that is 26, 2021-26. In this year uh, this is uh, this data we collect two months back. Already we did 26. So this, this uh, thing we get from a Indian government center that what is their uh, post-operative tissue uh, diagnosis planning. So that is they also do that three test that means the beta catenin gab yeah only in necessary case they are doing the tp53 mutation or dna methylation so medulloblastoma is not always booklet you see if that that is a win more than three years so you get more than 95 years survival. It is 10% among all medulloblastoma. In SHS group, if there is TP53 mutation, so that is bad, but in TP53 wild group, their outcome is also good. In group three outcome is very bad, but in group four, if there is no chromosomal deletion in chromosome 11, so in that group, the outcome is also good. So all medulloblastoma is not hopeless. Among the medulloblastoma, there is a hopeful group, and there is a lot of research. New molecule comes in the field, targeted therapy comes in the field, 
focus radiation is an important factor for future management. So there is some light of hope. Thank you for hearing my uh, speech. Thank you, Dr. Shripta Kumar Mukherjee for your excellent talk. And medulloblastoma is the most common pain and abnormal tumor of childhood. Nowadays, molecular subtyping or molecular genetic analysis, not only essential uh, diagnostic tool, also know the prognosis of the patient and plan the uh, optimum treatment. I must say, molecular genetic analysis is the a tough topic, but uh, you describe or explain very simply. Again, thank you, Dr. Sudhir Tukumar Mukherjee. So we are at the end of the session. Already, uh, uh, Professor Jai Dushan sir, Professor Jai Dushan sir is the head of the department of our neurosurgery department in National Institute of Neurosciences and Hospital. He is not only senior most, he is a caring senior of among all the neurosurgeons. So he is the panelist of today's session as well as our senior sir. So I request Professor Jai Dushan sir, uh, please, give a concluding speech as well as please discuss among, uh, about the topics. Professor Zahid Shukhtar. Thank you, Dr. Shudip Kumar Mukherjee and Mr. John Bennett for selecting me as a panelist of this session. I was hearing the session except the first 10 to 15 minutes while I was praying. So I was hearing Dr. Arman was saying about craniopharyngioma, then Maiduru Shoikat was saying about the classification. Dr. Shifat Tariq was saying about clinical features of the pediatric brain tumor. The last but not least, uh, Dr. Shudipto was telling very elaborately about the medulloblastoma, especially the recent development and recent strategy of management for which we can progress, we can see hope to the, uh, for the management of a malignant, one of the worst malignant tumor of the pediatric age group. So uh, I, my first, first of all, I thank Dr. Arman, he is showing, showing the endoscopically how he progressed to uh, craniopharyngioma and how he managed almost uh, a near total removal of the Kenya pharyngeal through the nose. So it's a very nice work that he presented and it's very nice presentation. And his, his work is very good. Uh, I hope he will continue this um, surgery endoscopically so do, without doing going through the cranium. And I think by day, by day by day, he will improve much more and all the people will get service. All the pediatric people will get service from him and his team, uh, especially our pediatric neurosurgery department. This will go forward. And I, I thank Dr. Sifat Tariq and Dr. Maidur for uh, being resident. They are presenting their topic nicely. And especially uh, Dr. Sifat was telling clinical presentation, he was telling this presentation very nicely, how a presentation, how the clinical features develops from uh, regarding the site of origin, regarding the uh, cause of the lesion. So it's good. And also Dr. Shrikot was uh, saying about the classification, which is a recent, he outlined the recent classification of the pediatric brain tumor. I, I must thanks to him. Uh, one thing I on the point regarding the medulloblastoma, Sudhik was saying the dropout from the OPD follow-up, it is one of the our drawback. The, the cancer in hospital, I know there is huge uh, queue, big queue of the patients. 
So the patients becoming, when the patient feels better, they becoming annoyed with this big queue in the uh, cancer in hospital by waiting for time, different date and date for days together. For this reason, few patients, I know few patients, they are telling me why they came uh, they came from the cancer in hospital without getting treatment. They are telling that there's a huge gathering and there is very mismanagement. For this reason, they cannot continue with these things. And these people also are poor patients. They cannot go to the private center so that they get the partial treatment or without getting the post and post operative management that is radiotherapy, chemotherapy. And then later on, they come with the complications or recurrence of the tumor. <laughs> post operative radiotherapy was telling, uh, Shudit was telling about the post operative radiotherapy and complication. I had, I know one patient who was getting, uh, who got full radiation, but after a few days, the patient starts to deteriorating due to radiation effect over the brain and on the spinal cord. Those radiation, radiotherapy, craniospinal irradiation causes encephalomalacia and also myelomalacia. For this reason, these patients in the long run sometimes becomes um, I mean, deteriorating, becomes deteriorates and also without getting uh, recurrence of the tumor, but patient is not, um, quality of life is bad. <clears throat> this is one thing. post body imaging, we are telling about the post body imaging, why he cannot do, he do, doesn't do uh, immediate post-op, MRI, I think it is not very much necessary because immediately after operation, we have the main concern about the post of hemorrhage, so whether there is hemorrhage within the uh, cranial cavity or the acute hydrocephalus. These two things that can easily be diagnosed by CT scan. The baby of small babies cannot do uh, MRI without having sedation or anesthesia. One baby which has got long, long term, long time surgery with anesthesia, after reverse, he, again, if he or she needs anesthesia for MRI, that will be bad. So, for this reason, my suggestion is. Should be the only city for in our settings because it is, we need to diagnose the whether hemorrhage or the acute hydrocephalus. This is my opinion. <clears throat> Another uh, thing was uh, Shudipta was very nicely elaborating the uh, med med meduloblastoma uh, management. For this thing, he was telling about the molecular subtyping. This is very important for further management on to and the uh, prognostic factor. It is one of the most important factor for prognosis. So molecular subtyping should be done if so far we can do it in our settings. So I think I thanks all the, who are hearing me and thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Shudipta. Thanks, Professor Jai sir. Your presence encouraged me very much and you positively, uh, your positive gesture is more encouraging and you just reschedule of our talk very nicely. And thanks for your presence. And thank you all for participating is in today's session. Our next session is Pediatric Brain Tumor Part 2. And that is fifth episode of our series uh, in Neurosurgical TV. Thanks, John Bennett to give us a chance for presenting the series of uh, webcast by Pediatric Neurosurgery Department means. And thank you all. John Bennett, please. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone, for participating. Sadipka, thank you for getting this together and bringing forward uh, pediatric neurosurgery on the web. There's just not many people on the web teaching now of pediatric neurosurgery online. Uh, and I really appreciate you guys filling that void. Uh, and Dr. Hosan, thank you for recapping everything. Uh, Dr. Aman, uh, Dr. Jamil. Um, and uh, I, I'm gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, see my job is to help 
not neurosurgery evolve, but televising, because uh, I want to do the best job to televise the material that is normally given in a hospital, in a private room, but you're able to bring it to a lot of people. Uh, and this, don't let this, uh, just there's just a couple of panelists. There's a lot of people watching now on YouTube and just, they're just watching anonymously. And I'm sure they're, they're picking something up. At any rate, we're going to test the feature after this uh, webcast is over, and you're all welcome to join. It's I, I put the link in the chat box. Just copy that and come in okay. after this Zoom. It's called a, the Speaker's Lounge. We're going to introduce it where after, or during the presentation, a speaker can go into the lounge and talk to people to answer questions away from the main presentation. The main presentation continues. However, there'll be a room open, for example, Sadipka after he finishes his, uh, his, his, uh, his presentation, comes into the room and people can sit with them privately and the regular Zoom continues. So I don't know if you understand that, but if you want to help us, just pick that link up and I'll see you in a few minutes. And thank you very much. Everybody, thank we'll you. See you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Okay, stop.